it's my great pleasure to tell you a little bit about our keynote speaker this morning, Bud Paxson. Bud and I have worked this room uh, together before, so I can tell you you're in for a, a real treat. No doubt you all know that Bud Paxson started the Home Shopping Network. You may also know that Bud started Pax TV, which is now known as Ion Television. As you will learn, Bud also started at least a dozen other businesses that were ahead of their time. Bud is a pioneer, and being a pioneer takes courage. Bud's got loads of courage. But I think the most remarkable and courageous pioneering that Bud has ever done has nothing to do with his businesses. It's not creating the multi-billion dollar home shopping industry, and it's not creating a TV network. The most courageous thing that Bud Paxson has done in his life, in my opinion, is being an outspoken Christian in Hollywood and in Beverly Hills and in Los Angeles and around the world in the entertainment industry. The last time I saw Bud, he said that he had had dinner with Sharon Stone the previous evening and some other guests at his house. And as Bud is apt to do, he brought up a discussion about his faith and had what I would imagine would be a challenging discussion with Sharon Stone. <laughs> Bud, have you seen Basic Instinct? It takes courage to challenge Sharon Stone. <laughs> and it takes courage to be an outspoken Christian in Hollywood and in the entertainment industry. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Bud Paxson. My name is Bud Paxson. And I was an entrepreneur. Now I work for God trying to build a little treasure in heaven. <laughs> and at my stage in life, I can look back and see the events that shaped my life as an entrepreneur. At about nine or 10, I asked my dad for $5. That's a long time ago. <laughs> he said to me, uh, no. <laughs> Go get a paper route like your buddy Chad next door. So I, I went next door and I asked Chad about delivering papers. He told me he got up at 5.30 every morning, folded the papers, put them in a sack, in the basket of his bicycle. Then he rode to every house on his route. And he got off the bike at every house took the paper and put it inside the screen door. Well, this was Rochester, New York, lots of snow and rain. <laughs> On Sundays, he had to make two trips because the paper was so thick. And then Wednesday night at dinner time, he went door to door to collect. And I said, well, Chad, how much do you make? And he said, $5 a week. I said, no deal. <laughs> That was just too much work for $5. <laughs> so I went back to my dad and I asked him for the $5. And he said, no. He said, look at the newspaper for a part-time job. And I did. And I came across an ad placed by the University of Rochester Medical Center who wanted to buy hamsters for a dollar each. I built some cages out of orange crates and within a few weeks, I was making between 15 and $20 a week, one trip to the grocery store weekly for the vegetable throwaways, toss them into the cages every morning before school, and then once a week, clean the cages. That was it. <laughs> a lot of fun, less work, and more money. <laughs> now my friend Chad was left-handed, and when you went out of the house, to the left, three blocks, there was a funeral parlor where he got a part-time job. And a few months later, Chad said to me, come on, 
they need more help, you can get a job there. So I went. And the day I went, two bodies came in. And I went out. <laughs> and by the way, Chad is now one of the largest funeral directors in that part of New York State. Well, I'm right-handed, and when you went out of my house to the right, three blocks, there was a radio station. And that's where my career in broadcasting started. Getting coffee for the DJs, sweeping up, taking out the trash. And soon I was on the air in the morning, every Saturday, doing a show called Kitty Go Round. During high school and college, I worked as a disc jockey. And in 1956, after college graduation, I bought a minority interest in a radio station where I was working. Later, I acquired 100% of the station. Then, for over 50 years, I've been a licensee of the Federal Communications Commission, operating radio and television stations. There were a lot of entrepreneurial sideshows along the way. And for the most part, they weren't good deals. I'll give you an example. In 1958, I opened a gas station on a narrow strip of land outside of uh, Newark, New York, which is between Rochester and Syracuse. We angled the pumps in pairs, and we called it El Rancho Gasseteria. <laughs> we invited people to save money by pumping their own gas. I was a bit early on that one. <laughs> Another one was a gas station and an automatic car wash. It was the drive through barn next to the highway called Quick Stop. You drive through, stop, get milk, beer. There were a bunch of others. The most important thing I can tell you was I was persistent. I kept trying. And during each of these side ventures, I always owned a radio station. In the early 80s, I had moved to Clearwater, Florida, and I owned an AM and an FM station there. The FM was doing fine, but the AM was struggling because this was the era in which FM took over and AM went sideways down the hill. I sold an appliance dealer a little over $1,000 worth of advertising on the AM, and I noticed he hadn't paid, so I went to collect. He said it didn't work, and he didn't want to pay. Well, that's not the way it works. <laughs> and after haggling with him a long time, he agreed to give me 112 rival electric can openers. <laughs> in lieu of cash. <laughs> well, because of the kids I had, I was driving a van at the time, and I loaded the, box of, the boxes of candles into the van, drove to the station, unloaded them, and put them in the uh, center aisle of the station, and went home. And the next morning, I realized I had to make payroll for the AM that day. And my savings book, if you remember those, some of you will, was at the station. I drove there and when I saw those can openers, I had an idea. The morning talk show host was on the air on the AM and I invited myself on the air with one box containing a rival can opener. I read the sales pitch on the box. The price was also printed right there too, $14.95. I told our listeners they could buy one for $9.75 but they had to pick it up at the station before noon with cash or check. We didn't have any credit card materials to, to, to take their credit card. To reserve one, they had to call in right away. In 15 minutes, we had the name and address and phone number of more than 112 buyers. <coughs> It was a good deal. They came, they paid. I met payroll. <laughs> and you know, and you know, you gotta remember, necessity 
is the mother of invention. <laughs> From that humble beginning we grew, first on radio, then to local cable, then to satellite, and then we started buying major market television stations called the Home Shopping Network. We were the very first nonstop, 24-hour-a-day shopping channel on TV. Now it's 1985 and we're a public company and I've cashed out a bit. I'm wealthy by most standards and we're growing by incredible strides. During the year of 1986, I'm away from home over 260 days that year, out buying TV stations across the U.S. and traveling around the world to 104 countries, buying material for home shopping to sell. It was a giant alligator we kept having to feed it. Well, it was getting toward Christmas and what I did was send home Christmas gifts. They were wrapped and I kept sending them back. I got home, I think about Jan about December the 21st. And on Christmas morning, you could hardly get into the living room. We opened gifts from 9.30 until after 12 noon. And when we were done, my wife said she wanted to talk to me. And we would meet out on the outside patio. It was a beautiful Christmas day in Florida. When I went outside, she was smoking, something I had never seen her do. I wasn't ready for what she said. When my wife spoke, her words were like a bowl of lightning out of a blue sky. She said she was in love with another man and was leaving me that day. And within the hour, she was packed and gone. I was a broken man. All I could do was cry hour after hour. I was absolutely and completely emotionally bankrupt. I'd lost my wife and I wasn't close to my kids. And when my wife walked out, I realized everything I had devoted my life to couldn't make me happy. My life had become meaningless. My kids, who were in their late teens and mid-twenties, stayed with me and tried to comfort me. I had planned New Year's in Las Vegas for the whole family. Not to gamble, but to see the shows and celebrate New Year's. The kids insisted we go. They wanted to get reacquainted with Dad. They said they loved me and we needed a vacation. We went, along with my umpteenth Kleenex box. And New Year's Eve, we were at Caesar's Palace in the celebrity showroom. Buddy Hackett was on stage. My kids and everyone else were laughing. And tears were running down my face. And shortly after midnight, I excused myself and I went to my room. It was the loneliest place in the world. I worried, I felt sorry for myself. I was 52 and I was alone. I sat on the couch, I sat on the bed, I fretted, I was a wreck. I had everything, but I had nothing. About 4 a.m. I remembered there was probably a Gideon Bible in this room. I found it and began to read. When I was growing up, this is how I went to church. <laughs> but at about 14, I was taller than my mother could reach up here. <laughs> I stopped going. But about 5 a.m. on that New Year's morning, 1987, while reading the Gideon Bible, I realized I was separated from God by my sins. I read the sinner's prayer and asked Jesus to come into my life. 
I cannot adequately express to you in words what transpired. I can only tell you that Jesus came, comforted me, poured out his love on me, and gave me hope. The experience was almost supernatural. And after a while, I fell into a deep sleep for the first time since Christmas. When we went home, I became a Christian fanatic. I studied the Bible for hours every day. I attended church, Bible study, spent hours on the phone with Christian scholars, ministers, literally any Christian who would talk to me. At first, I have to admit, I was expecting God to get my wife back. Month after month, I worked on my faith and it grew. I wanted to graduate from God University. <laughs> One day, however, I realized God simply wanted a personal relationship with me. He wasn't planning to get my wife back. So I started the divorce and soon it was finalized.